Uh, it's lovely to see you all and we're really looking forward to the blessing that God's going to bring us and uh, we're so privileged to have Charles Douglas with us again tonight and, and his message is absolutely amazing. But before we listen to God's word and, and study God's word, let's just open with a word of prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you are to us. Thank you for your word. It's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's alive. And we thank you for that. Thank you for the inspiration that was given to all these authors all these years ago. Uh, and it's still applicable today. We just pray for your servant. We ask, Father, that you will just bless him as he brings his word to us. And we just ask, Father, that you will just open up your word to us and show us a new thing. And just teach us your ways. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me say at the very beginning how grateful I am to uh, have the opportunity to come and share God's word with you. And I'm also grateful to Tom and everyone here at the Congregational Church at Sanka for giving me the opportunity to uh, do that. I appreciate it very, very much indeed. And, uh, of course, I appreciate the fellow behind the camera as well. And uh, I appreciate all the help and all the encouragement I've been getting over the last few weeks. That being said, I want to have a little introduction of what I shall try and endeavour to do over the next little time period. And uh, what I want to try and do is to create a little theme coming at it from a little bit different angles so that the message really gets through in the light of the days in which we live. Now, this evening, as I said before, I want to dwell on that text that to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. And God willing, over the next uh, time period, what I would like to do is then give some teaching on the men of Issachar who understood the times in which they lived and they, had, they knew what Israel ought to do. So they had the uh, knowledge and then they had the wisdom of how to apply that knowledge in the times that they lived in Israel and equate that to our own times which we live today. Then after that, I'd like to give a little theme on Babylon rising. Now, many preachers have taken Babylon and they've taught on Babylon, Babylon rising, and uh, give it other titles. But it seems as if there is a surge of what's called the Babylonian spirit rising again in these last days. So that you will have spiritual Babylon, which will try to disrupt and hinder and frustrate the uh, work of God, then you will have commercial Babylon in which we seem to be moving into very quickly with all of the big controls that the international banks and monetary systems have and all the debt that many countries are in to the World Bank. So we're moving into a time of Babylon rising, not only spiritually, but uh, commercially, and uh, perhaps even in the days that lie ahead, it will arise physically. It may not be called Babylon, but there may be a ge geographical position uh, whereby there is the spirit and the desire and the wherefore all of Babylon to exercise its power in this world from a central geographical position it may not be called Babylon, but it may be some metropolitan centre that operates in the spirit of Babylon and has the same goals. And then what I'd like to try and do is to give some thoughts on the valley of Akar. Akar, a man who stopped the victory of God's people. One man stopped the victory of all of God's people. One man stopped Israel from going forward. 
And he did that because he got his eye on a Babylonian garment. And it shows you what one person can do who is not in the will of God and disobeys God and frustrates the plans and purposes of God and stops the people of God going forward. And then, of course, the people of God pass through the Valley of Acre and then we can understand what God can do in that particular Valley of Acre. But it all dovetails into the wisdom that we should be having in the light of the days in which we live. That said, let's now start. <laughs> so we go to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16, which says, Therefore be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Harmless, the Greek meaning for harmless has that sense of unmixed, pure. Fundamentally, the idea is this. It is the idea of the absence of foreign mixtures coming in and spoiling. Now, we all probably have gold rings on our fingers. Uh, I have one that was my grandmother's ring, and I'm sure we all have roll of gold on our fingers. But gold's got to be purified. There are foreign mixtures in gold. So it's got to be through the furnace, and purified to different qualities. 9 carat, 18 carat, 22 carat, gets purer and purer, taking all the foreign bodies out of it. So that's basically what harmless means in that Greek sense of that word, unmixed, pure, absence of foreign mixture. So when it's used about a person to be as harmless as a dove, it means to be without admixture of evil, free from guile, innocent. We read these words in John chapter 1 and verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. In other words, without admixture of evil, no deceit. We read again in the first chapter of John in verse 24, it tells us this, that Jesus... He knew all men, for he himself knew what was in man. So we see that when Nathaniel was coming to him, Nathaniel's character was an open book to Jesus. Jesus read him through and through. One of the things that we will experience as believers when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, which is called the Bema seat, they were not being judged for sin, but were being judged according to what we have done in the flesh concerning rewards. And there you will have the same Jesus who could look at Nathaniel and say, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. He will look at us through his same eyes and our whole life, our whole being, our soul, our sanctum, inner sanctum, will be there open before him. We will be able to hide nothing and will be judged according to what we have done in the flesh as we sought to serve him. We will be an open book at the judgment seat of Christ. We won't be able to make any excuses or hide. Therefore, be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Guile is used in the earlier Greek writers as a word for bait when you go fishing. You put some bait on the end of your line, you cast it, you try and catch the fish, you try and tempt the fish by getting the bait to move in the water. So it came to signify any cunning contrivance or for deceiving, catching out contrivance. Now Jacob, in the Bible, that ancestor of the Jewish people, Jacob, before he had a change of heart and before he had a change of his name to Israel, he was quite a cunning man. He got up to some little tricks, did Jacob, in those days. Now, when it says this, that an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile, Temple gives this translation of John 1 and verse 47, and Morgan uh, gives the same sense, an Israelite in whom there is no 
Jacob. It's up to us while well, we have the opportunity to make sure there's no Jacob within us. The possibility is there for us in the new creation in Christ, and it should be our goal to be as harmless as doves. But Jesus said this, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now that is, looks like disaster waiting to happen, doesn't it? Wolves savage sheep. That's what happens to them. So I'm going to send you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. Doesn't sound like a good strategy. But then he comes in, therefore be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. In other words, be tender-hearted, but be tough-minded. Why? Well, verse 17 tells us, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and scourge you in their synagogues. Now, we've all seen those old movies where they have a werewolf, a person changing into a wolf, a man changing into a wolf, and they're called a werewolf. No, the real werewolves are all round about us as we seek to put forward the kingdom of God. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. Beware of men, they're the real werewolves. And it will come into play more and more in these last days in which we live. So Jesus' warnings to those who will be exposed to the snarling hatred and to the vicious violence found in the midst of rules by the Lord's servants as they seek to fulfill their ministry in Christ. Now we come to three questions here. First, what is wisdom in the biblical sense? It's a question we should ask ourselves. Second, how do we obtain biblical wisdom? And the third question is this, how do we exercise this wisdom? My words, my silence, my action, or by passive yielding? How do we exercise biblical wisdom? The concept of wisdom is an important one, and it may be particularly important for us in our technological society. I'm standing before technology right now. Now, when I started trying to preach and do a little bit of preaching with a young man, there was no such technology. But now I'm standing in front of technology. And it's advancing at a, a tremendous rate. So we put an awful lot of emphasis on technology. I'm amazed that Tom, he comes on a Sunday and he can read his Bible on his laptop and he can fix the music words on his laptop if there's not going right and he can do everything on his laptop and I'm standing there and amazing I can't even turn on a mobile phone <laughs> but Tom is good at that part of technology and I take my hat off to him I could not do the work that Charles does I do not have a technological brain Come to think of it, I don't have much of a brain at the best of times, but uh, we'll keep that to be our secret. We won't tell anyone. Right. So the concept of wisdom is important in this technological society where we place a strong emphasis on knowledge. The scriptures, however, do not make the mistake of confusing wisdom with other mental capabilities or of giving wisdom less than its central place. Now, wisdom and natural intelligence do not always share the same bed. If you have your Bibles and you want to, we can turn to Proverbs chapter 9. This is part of the wisdom literature from the Bible. Proverbs chapter 9, and we will read the first six verses. And these words are recorded there, reading from verse 1 of chapter 9 of Proverbs. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewed out her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. 
She set out, she's sorry, she has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come, eat my bread, drink of the wine I have mixed, leave your simple ways and live, walk in the way of insight. From chapter 1 through to chapter 8 in the book of Proverbs, you have wisdom and folly in all of those chapters. Wisdom and folly, both giving out invitations. So the question to us is, whose table will we sit at? Whose banquet will we enjoy? Now, to make the right choice, we must have biblical wisdom. Again, turning in our Bibles over to the book of James and to uh, James chapter uh, 3 of the epistle of James, James chapter 3, and reading from verse 3, we can read these words. Sorry, reading from verse 13, James 3, reading from verse 13 to verse 17. Who is wise and understanding among you? That's a good question for all of us. <laughs> Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. It is earthly unspiritual, demonic. For where there is jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, and then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. So here we have in this passage two kinds of wisdom or two different sources of wisdom. First of all, wisdom from our fallen nature, our old man. It never, he never seems to go away. He's always lingering there trying to take every opportunity with us. So our old man, our old nature, which when he is being a little bit nasty, can hurt others. Not only can he hurt others, but he can do great harm to the work of God. When our old man is in full flow with earthly, unspiritual wisdom, then it can become a platform for the demonic. You see, we give the devil many times too much credit for coming in and taking control and without invitation. But many times we are building platforms for him to build upon. And that was what was happening here in James. They were building a platform for the enemy to come in and exercise unspiritual, demonic wisdom, a platform for the demonic. And when that happens, then the flaming darts of the devil start being thrown around, and people getting hurt and pierced by them, and they come flying in, and they wound, and some wounds take a long, long time to heal, if ever they do heal at times. And the result is that is confusion in people's lives. But the wisdom from above, because God is not the God of confusion, it is not seen in natural cognitive exercise, but wisdom from above in a godly spiritual behavioral exercise. The qualities we see in verse 17, that should be seen and felt in the midst of God's people. That's true wisdom in conduct and in behavior. Well, going back to Proverbs again. Now, in chapter 9, we have two women. The first is pure, the second is impure. Two voices, two invitations. 
First you have Lady Wisdom. And we'll just go over there. Lady Wisdom. And we'll read from verse 4. And listen to this, these words. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come eat my bread, drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live, walk in the way of insight. That is Lady Wisdom's invitation. But then there's Lady Folly. And we'll look at verse 16 and we'll read what Lady Folly says. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, the exact same words, the same invitation, the same inviting tone. That's why there's such confusion in the Church of Jesus Christ today. People cannot discern between when Lady Wisdom speaks and Lady Folly speaks. And that's what brings a lot of confusion and a lot of hurt. So there are two voices and two invitations. But as you read on in verse 17 from Lady Folly, whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet. Bread eaten in secret is pleasant. It eventually comes out where she really is coming from. The same invitation, the same words, the same inviting tone of voice. And this is why I need wisdom from above. Going over into the book of Romans for a moment and into Romans chapter 8 and reading one verse from Romans chapter 8, verse 26, we read these words. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what... Uh, what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit themselves intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Weakness here has the sense of, well, the primary reference here is, when you dig into it a little bit, is here is to mental ignorance. And when we see that, we read it again, likewise the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, our mental ignorance in many points, we see our limitations here. Now there are times when we are going through deep waters. How should we pray? You say, oh God, I don't know what to pray. I don't know what, what, what words to bring before you. There's such a problem and I'm in. How can I pray? I don't know exact words. And I've been there and I've been there quite recently in some situations. Lord, what, what way do I pray here? And you find yourself in silence before God, but with a profound ache deep within you. But, standing over against that limitation is a heart-gladdening invitation. The Spirit helps us. Robertson writes this, the Holy Spirit lays hold of our weaknesses along with us and carries his part of the burden facing us as if two men were carrying a log, one at each side of the log. And as they're carrying the log along, they're facing each other. And you've got your end, and the Spirit has his end of that log. You're facing each other. The Spirit helps us. And you've got this burden, you've got this difficulty, and you're carrying it. You say, oh, this is murder. I'm never going to make it from here to there with this. But you're facing him. And he's facing you. And he's holding the other end. I'm here with you. I'm here to help you. I am the divine paracletus. The one who stands aside, alongside to help. And we've got to come back into the reality of that. That we have the divine paraclesis. Someone who is called alongside to help us. When Jesus says, I'm going away, but I will send a comforter to you. Someone just like me 
as Jesus was the Paracletus and helping society and his disciples at that time, so the Holy Spirit would exercise the same Paracletus exercise of ministry and coming alongside. I have a burden, I have a difficulty, but I'm at the other end of the log. I'm carrying it with you. The Spirit helps us. He intercedes with us. Alfred describes beautifully, I think, the meaning of Romans 8.26. He writes, The Holy Spirit of God dwelling in us, knowing our wants better than we, himself pleads in our prayers, raising us to higher and holier desires than we can express in words which can only find utterance in sighs and aspirations. One of the most important ministries of the Holy Spirit is that of aiding us in prayer. One of the things I miss uh, in from the fellowship that we used to, well, when I used to pastor a church, pastor two churches down in the northeast of England, was in the prayer meeting. I didn't have to do a lot of coaxing to get people to pray. People would stand up and pray. And then when we had the Sunday morning meeting and we were gathered around the Lord's table, you know, people would come and give their individual thanks to God. Stand up and pray. Thank you, Lord, for helping me through this week. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for the love and the grace and the mercy that you have shown us. Thank you for all that this table means. And whatever their prayer was, they would do it voluntary and wholeheartedly. And it added to the meeting and to the service of God. And uh, I miss that. I miss that. I miss that body ministry coming together. I really do. So that... It is one of the most important ministries of the Holy Spirit is to aid us in prayer. Wisdom. There's always been a need for wisdom in the life of the community of faith, which has not always been there to the degree that it should have been. It may well be that part of Satan's last day's strategy against the church is to make the church look foolish in the eyes of the world and making the church look foolish, the church then loses credibility. Now that being the case, then there is a great need for wisdom. Question again, how can wisdom from above be conveyed to the outside world to regain credibility within the church. Well, Proverbs 8, 12, these words are recorded. I, wisdom, wisdom personified, means that God is speaking behind this. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find knowledge and discretion. Prudence, of course, embodies in practice the principles of wisdom. Dwell with prudence. If the church is to regain credibility, then prudence must be our inseparable companion. It's not prudent to say this at this time. It is not prudent to act in this way at this time. And believers must again begin to think I will dwell with prudence, especially in these days when people are trying to catch the church out with the PC laws and the, all the hate laws that come in. We need prudence. Prudence to say the word of wisdom at the right time and the purposes of God. Dwell with prudence, our inseparable companion. It's a must. It's a must to govern all our own actions and to direct the actions to others. And how do we direct the actions to others with prudence, if we dwell with prudence? By good, godly counsel, with sound exposition of God's word. Psalm 119 and verse 130. 
The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. And of course, in the book of Proverbs, we read a lot about the simple. The simple. What is the simple? Who is the simple? The simple is a person who is not firmly committed to wisdom. He or she will not apply themselves to the discipline needed to gain and to grow in wisdom. And this is a thing that you can see in younger people. And older Christians need to begin to encourage younger people to grow in wisdom. The great work of prudence is to discover and so avoid all the false counsel and the devices that would lead those lacking discernment to be attracted by the invitation of lady folly, spiritually speaking. If, if Satan's plan or part of his strategy is to make the church look foolish, then there are th at least three ways that we can see this happening in our day and generation. One, prophets. A lot of people call themselves prophets. A lot of people say they exercise a prophetic ministry. That's great. If you are a genuine prophet in God, a prophet, someone who speaks as the oracles of God, someone who is the mouthpiece of God, someone when he speaks, someone who ministers in a prophetic sense, not only impacts your mind and your understanding with a knowledge of God's word, but you feel impressed upon your heart an impact of something directly from God as the oracles of God are coming through the mouthpiece of the prophet. In true prophetic ministry, this is, can happen and this is a possibility. And when you've sat under it and you feel it and you go out and you feel strengthened or you feel that you've had some guidance or you feel that you've really been helped. God's prophet speaking forth the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Speaking false prophecies. Credibility undermined. And we see this crazy thing happening when people get up and they give the most ridiculous prophecies. They not only give the most ridiculous prophecies, but the gyrations of their bodies as they're giving these ridiculous prophecies and they're saying it's because they're controlled by the Spirit. Rubbish. The Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman. He never overrules or overrides your own makeup or your own personality. No, I believe it's coming from another source when people are sitting under those ridiculous prophecies and foolish gyrations of the bodies that are coming forth and they're saying it's from God. Big, big question marks, and I doubt it very much. Proverbs 8.13 says this, perverted speech or perverted mouth. It depends upon the translation you're reading, but it means both the same. Perverted speech, perverted mouth. Say, God says, I hate. Very strong language. You see, there are times when simply God doesn't mess about. He speaks plainly. I hate. False doctrines, perverted speech. I hate. Evil counsel, perverted mouth. I hate. Devilish deceit, perverted speech. I hate. God is very, very clear on this. The second thing is this. The fear of the Lord is linked with wisdom. The lack of it, of course, is linked with folly. So in Proverbs 8.13, we read these words, same verse, we read these words. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, blatant sin in the church, credibility 
undermined in the eyes of the world and in the eyes of everyone else in the church family. Blatant sin in the church. It's got to be dealt with. People come in now and it's very difficult. They come in and they come in with a lot of baggage being in the world. And sometimes they, they come in and you think a man and a woman, they're, oh, yeah, nice little family. They're married and that. They're not even married at times. They're just living together. They're partners. I hate that phrase, don't you? You know, you go in and you sign a form or they ask you a question. Do you have a partner? No. Oh, you don't? No, I have a wife. <laughs> there is a difference. But it's in the church. It's incredible. It's in the church. And all the other unspeakable relationships that come into church, blatant sin in the church, credibility undermined, and we're seeing that more and more. And the third thing is this, the wisdom of the world. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. The world in its wisdom produced evolution. And all the other things that spring from it. If we are simply, as it once was, by a famous anthropologist who says that we are simply the naked ape. I can't, if you're old enough, you can remember those programs on television, the naked ape. If we are only a naked ape, then we will behave in beast-like manners and ways. Evolution and all the other things that spring from it. The church seeking by the wisdom of the world to fill its seats. God wants us to be as harmless as a dove, but we cannot apply the strategies of the world to fill the church. So you go out, you take a little board with you. I'm going to knock the door. Okay. Hi, I'm from the local church. I won't say which church it is. <laughs> but I'm from the local church, right. Uh, you don't go to church? No, I don't go to church, no. If you would come to church, what would you like the church to be like? Well, I would like it to have great music. Right, great music. What else would you like? Well, I would like to have some, some atmosphere. Right, we can make atmosphere. Get the smoke machines out, will you? We'll get atmosphere going here. Okay, what else would you like? Well, I would like it to be really friendly, you know, and nobody pointing the finger to me, you know. Nobody saying, oh, I'm a sinner and I'm going to hell. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear how I can grow up as an individual. I want to know how to reach my full potential in this life. Okay, motivational speaking. We'll get that down there. Well, we're doing well. You cannot fill the church the way the world fills its auditoriums. But it is being done. You get the crowds. But we are not called to get the crowds. We are called to make disciples of all men and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's a big difference. So God wants us to be as harmless as a dove, but he does not want us to be a silly dove. Hosea 7 and verse 11 says this, Ephraim is like a dove, silly and without sense. Why? Because Ephraim was calling to Egypt when Ephraim was in difficulty, calling to Egypt which is speaking of the world. And when the church has got into difficulties many times, it's gone to the world for help. We shouldn't go to the world for help. Our help is in the Lord and no other place. So Ephraim is a silly dove without sense. Why? Going to Assyria, speaking of the arm of flesh, might, strong Syria. No, we are to be as wise as serpents. Just a little thought here I want to bring to you. And it's in four parts. 
And if you just excuse me for a moment. So just a little thought in four parts on the release of the dove from Noah's ark. If we are to be useful servants, and I know that many of us have a desire to be useful servants, and I often pray to God, Lord, I'm an unprofitable servant, and I need to be better. But if we are to be useful servants in the things of God, seeking to bring knowledge and information as to the conditions of where we are at any particular time in the dealings of God in this world, then the nature of the dove in Noah's time may give us an example. Now, when they built the ark, you will remember that they brought down the roof and they built the ark up, but there was an 18-inch like window gap all around about the ark for light and for circulation of air. And you can read about that in Genesis 6, 16 and Genesis 8, 6. So there was an 18-inch gap, an 18-inch window round about the ark where the roof and the other parts of the ark were coming together. The first little thought is this. The waters of the flood, of course, speaks of the judgment of God. The flood speaking to us plainly of the eschatological judgment to come. Going over into uh, first Peter, uh, Second Peter for a moment, I wasn't going to read this for the sake of time, and I don't want to go on too long. Uh, but going over to Second Peter and to chapter three, reading from verse five. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. And by the same word the heavens and the earth that are now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. That's exactly what happened in the flood. It was for the destruction of the ungodly because they had corrupted the whole earth. Before I came out, I was watching uh, the news on Channel 5 and it was showing you the pollutions of the oceans uh, with all the plastic in the, all the Pacific Islands and how people were going around and said, this is on the tip of the iceberg. The earth is being polluted. We are corrupting. We are abusing our stewardship that God gave to Adam at the beginning to take care of this world. And we're abusing that. And the whole earth was corrupted in the time of Noah. Corrupted in thought, corrupted in desires, corrupted in actions. It was a very violent time. Haven't you noticed the upsurge of violence recently? The stabbings that are happening in big cities. I remember when we were younger, if there was a murder in the country, it was splattered all over the headlines. It just seems to be a common day thing nowadays. Violence. The whole earth was corrupted, and so the flood came about. But it's speaking of another judgment that is to come. We are between two judgments. The judgments of Noah's flood, that the earth was corrupted by the people that lived there, and he destroyed the ungodly with the water. We are now in the in-between stage, and there is a judgment of fire coming for the destruction of the ungodly. We are between these two judgments. The second coming of Christ and the judgment to come is played down or it is ignored, even mocked today. Why is that? There has been a lowing of the church into a sleepy attitude of neglect of the study of this important doctrine. Second Peter, again chapter 3, reading from verse 3. Knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, 
and they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. It's just carrying on the same way. What do you do about that? Why do they have this attitude? And the reason is they misunderstand the long-suffering or the patience of God. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago, the earth was formed out of water, through water by the word of God, and that by these means the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished, but by the same word the heavens and the earth now exist are stored up for fire, are being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So we're not going to deal with this doctrine. We're not going to teach about the second coming of Christ. We're not going to deal about a day of judgment coming. We're not going to teach about end times and end days. We're not going to do that because they misunderstand the long-suffering and the patience of God. In verse 9, we see the purpose of long-suffering, not wishing that any should perish. In verse 15 of the same chapter, we see the provision of long-suffering and count the long-suffering, the patience of our God, as salvation. The second little thought is this, the ark. A remnant out of all of mankind of that day was saved through God's instruction. It pays to listen to God. Flee from the wrath of to come. What an old-fashioned message. <laughs> what an old fashioned well when was the last time you heard that preach flee from the wrath to come you never hear it now well it's old fashioned we don't want to hear that we want to hear other things we want to hear things that tickle our ears <laughs> nice little doctrines that soothe ourselves I've got to face the boss tomorrow I need something nice to face the boss but at least I to tickle my ears whatever but flee from the wrath to come. I don't want to hear about that. It's old fashioned. A question that I ask myself is do you think that Noah preached that old fashioned message? <laughs> it was vitally important that he did in that day because the wrath of God was coming against the ungodly. And he cried out, Flee from the wrath to come. He may not have used those words, but the message would be saying the same Flee from the wrath to come. The ark. Well, the ark was safe and secure for Noah and his family as long as they were in the ark. And as we obey God's instruction and flee from the wrath to come and put our eternal welfare of first importance and place in our lives in, and place our lives in Christ, our ark of refuge from the coming judgment of God then we are safe and secure only as we are in Christ. What saved Noah? Faith and obedience. He believed he heard from God and he acted upon him. Flee from the wrath to come. So he heard from God, built an ark, and he built an ark. Faith and he obeyed. A third little thought, the raven, speaking of cardinal things, because it feeds on carrion. In chapter 8 of Genesis and verse 7, the New King James says, it went out to and fro. The NIV says back and forth. The literal meaning comes out this way, went out going and returning. Now on the words of the literal translation, we can picture it this way. And as I said, you don't have to accept this, it's just a thought. The raven sometimes going from the ark and sometimes returning to the ark, but never again entering into it. 
the little lesson that we may learn from this picture is the cardinal never entering into the things of Christ, but will rest upon the ark, linger upon them. And this is how many undiscerning are fooled in these latter days. The cardinal lingering around the spiritual things of God and confusing people and leading many astray. The raven never went through the 18-inch opening again and thereby giving no information to Noah. Noah was kept in the dark because Noah sent the raven out so that he could receive any information back. The cardinal never benefits God's servants. Then again, we can read it this way. We can read the raven flew here and there. In other words, kept flying over the waters, never going near the ark. Then uh, the New American Standard would seek to put it that way. It did not seek to enter the ark again. The raven, the cardinal things, has no homing instinct for the ark. The cardinal has no homing instinct for the things of Christ. Perhaps it rests and fed on some carcass. The cardinal feeds on dead flesh. The fourth little thought is this, the dove found no rest for the sole of her feet. Now this world is not our home, <laughs> but there's a new world coming. Everybody was supposed to say hallelujah at that part. <laughs> but there is a new world coming in Genesis 8 and 9. But the days of Noah, sorry, but the dove found no resting place for the sole of her feet. So she returned to him into the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Then he, that's of course Noah, put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. The dove had a necessity, and that necessity was to rest. And because of her acquaintance with Noah, this is the one who feeds me. This is the one who handles me gently. She knew Noah. She did not fear Noah's hand upon her. Psalm 145 and verse 16 says this, You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. And in that we see the provision of God. The dove knew by instinct the provision of Noah. We, by faith and relationship, know the provision of God. The dove's return provided information as to the conditions. And we need the spirit of the divine dove, the Holy Spirit, as to the conditions and the timings in God. Verse 10, Noah waited seven more days. And the lesson for us there is patience in the servant of God the wisdom of patience. Verse 11, the dove returns with a fresh depocked olive leaf, the emblem of peace, the earnest of fruitfulness. No enigma there as to restoration, but enlightenment of a new beginning. Verse 12, Noah waited seven more days and the dove did not return. And what is the message of no return? The conditions are right for habitation. We must learn to discern what the Holy Spirit is saying. Hebrews 4 and 13. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now in the light of this, must give an account. Should we not act and speak in wisdom from above? How bitterly, and I really mean this, how bitterly I regret not functioning in the wisdom from above. It would have saved me many a heartache and many a headache. In Psalm 139 from verse 1 to through to verse 4, we have there, uh, I'll just read it, Psalm 139, and the first four verses, if you can just bear with me for a moment. 
O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my mouth, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. And here we have the omniscience and the discernment of God brought down to a very, very personal level. My thoughts, my actions, my words are vital are of vital interest to my Heavenly Father. Why is that? Because he desires that we should think, act, speak in wisdom. For he knows when that I think, act, speak in a foolish manner, it is detrimental to myself, to others, and to the cause of Christ. In Romans 11.33, these words are recorded. Oh, the depth. It's like a great big sigh. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Here we have a deep, unfathomable well of wealth, of wisdom to draw from. But we never do. But we should. Verse 33 again says this, How unsearchable are all his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways. And verse 33 again, For it is me, sorry, it is for me. Well, when I read that again, I hesitated like I'm hesitating now. And I said, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. That for me, it was head scratching time. And the state of my hair at this time, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> but it was head scratching time. Why? The knowledge of God, the perception of God, the omniscience of God, knowing all about me. It made me scratch my head a bit, and I hesitated, as I did just there. Question, does it make it difficult for us to fully comprehend how God has foreknowledge of events in our lives and are conditioned upon our free will? He knows that by an act of our free will, we are going to say or do something foolish. Now, Without abusing our free will, God leads someone to speak a word of wisdom to us. We then have the choice to accept or not to accept that word of wisdom. And therefore, we will either act foolishly or wisely. But God has done his part in knowing what we were going to do. He sent a remedy, but it was up to us to either accept or not to accept. So our free will came into that part. God did his part and we then acted accordingly as we would. Colossians 2, 3 says this, and it describes Christ as one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, hidden, stored up for those in Christ, hidden from view from those outside of Christ, treasures, great value, great worth, and we are not to cast our peril before swine. Wisdom and knowledge are not in a depository. They are in a depository. They are in a person, not a place. James 1 and 5 says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And here we have the grace and the generosity of God. Wisdom is the joining of the knowledge of truth to give direction and meaning to our experiences in life. In Him, in Him, in Him, in whom is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in Him we live and move and have our being. Acts 2 and 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Here is wisdom's foundation. 1 Corinthians 14 and 26. How is it, brethren, whenever you come together, each one of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things done 
be done for edification. Here is the wisdom's parameters. 1 Corinthians 14 and 10, let all things be done decently and in order. Here is wisdom's instructions. Ecclesiastes 2.13, then I saw that there was more gain in wisdom than in folly. Wisdom excels folly. Ecclesiastes 7 and 12, the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves life of him who had it. Wisdom is a lifesaver. Therefore, be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Now in these days, now what do we mean by in these days? Well, the, de the Bible makes it very clear. In the latter days, in the days of Noah, in the days of Lot, in the days of Lady Folly rising again, which in fact is the spirit of Jezebel. But what is Jezebel's function? Jezebel's function is to mislead misdirect, lead astray, and the result of that is spiritual decay. Now, how do we combat that? Well, in Hebrews 10, 25, it tells us, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of son, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It may be or can be a problem for a lot of people, unable to find a safe, sensible, and sound church. You see, we are part of the community or the family of faith. Persevering in this Laodicean age in which we live, we need to come together for mutual encouragement. Even if there's only a very small group, do not be discouraged but meet to encourage, meet together. We meet together to minister to the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. We meet together to minister to each other in the power of the Holy Spirit. We go out to a dying world to minister to them by the power of the Holy Spirit. From meeting together in the power of the Holy Spirit, life will flow, life in new birth, people being saved, life in restoration, backsliders being restored, life in the Spirit in our praise and worship unto Jesus, the head of the church. Life affected by God's word to us. Your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart, says Jeremiah in chapter 15 and verse 16. I want to end with first a question Second, an exhortation. And third, a brief comment. First, the question, where is the voice of wisdom today? Well, the answer is where it has always been. Proverbs 1 and 20. Wisdom cries out in the streets. She raises her voice in the open squares. Wisdom has been delivered to mankind. How? Where? When? Well, it tells us very clearly. God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in the past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. Wisdom cries out through the prophets, through the apostles, and to us today, through the ministry and the writings of the apostles in the New Testament, and especially by his beloved Son and by our witness of him. Wisdom cries out in the streets today. Second, an exhortation. To do what? Read Proverbs chapter 1, verses 20 to 33. Find out more about wisdom's appeal and its rejection by those who and for what reasons. There is a good and there is a great profitable study there if you read those verses. So that's a wee word of exhortation. Third, a brief comment on Proverbs 1 and verses 20 to 33. There's a great sadness in this passage. The sadness of wisdom's 
unheeded appeal. There are three classes of people who pay no heed to wisdom's appeal. Verse 22, the simple. The root seems to mean open to influence, but they refuse wisdom and so remain simple, naive to the things of God. Verse 22 again, scorners and scoffers, they are wisdom's worst enemies, but they refuse wisdom and so and because they refuse wisdom, they are arrogant, they are cynical and defiant. Their wisdom's worst enemies, the scoffers. And then verse 22 again, fools, one who is insensitive to the moral truth and acts without fear of regard to it. There's a lot more in that one verse. In verse 23, we have an earnest appeal Excuse me. If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit on you and I will make words, my words known to you. Now here we have an admonition, if responded to, will reap tremendous benefits. In verses 24 to 32, because I called and you refused. If you read down to verse 32, you will see the dire consequences of that refusal. In verse 33, for those who obey wisdom's voice, the promise of true security. Just a very short and simple little look at this passage, but now you go on and read for yourselves. Now I can only end with this, and suddenly people all over the auditorium are looking at one another. Is he really going to end? <laughs> Is he going to stop? <laughs> Does he really mean it? <laughs> Is he going to end? Yes. And I can only end with Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church. In Ephesians 1.17 I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Here is wisdom's goal. Therefore, be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. And if you have been, thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much for that tonight, Charles. Your ministry is something else. Let's just close with prayer before we go our separate ways. Lord, your word is a, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Help us, Father, just to walk in that light, tread on that path. And we just ask, Father, that what we've learned and what has been revealed from your word tonight, that you will help us just to spring into action and to go and tell others. Part us now with your richest blessing. For everything we ask is in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. For more information about Moriel, check out our website, www.moriel.org.